This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 207, recorded on November 16th, 2012. Hi everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How you doing? Doing okay. Yeah, good weather out there today? Yeah, yeah, it's nice uh, Nice late autumn weather, a little chilly, but not too bad, and no precipitation, so we like that. It's pretty blue skies, right? Yeah. Same here. Here it is 7 degrees in New York City and sunny. Very nice day. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, guys. It's even better here. It's 51 Fahrenheit, 11 Celsius. Ooh, nice. Warmer, huh? Blue skies. Nice. All good weather. Also joining us today for a return within a couple of weeks from the University of Maryland at Baltimore, Matt Freeman. Hello, everyone. How are Hello. you? I guess the Baltimore weather is like New York weather, probably, right? Yeah, it's 50 degrees, bright blue sky. Really nice today, actually. Excellent. Well, this is all post-Sandy weather. Mm. Yeah. I have to tell you more Sandy story. Just five minutes, okay? (laughs) Okay. So uh, we went this week. We were allowed to go on on the Barrier Island in New Jersey, which is that strip of land uh, on the east coast of New Jersey where all the beach houses are. Right. Had been closed because the thing really got hammered, and there was a lot of uh, a lot of dangerous stuff there. So our house took on water, and we had to rip up the rug, throw out a lot of furniture, and we had to take off the baseboard and the lower two feet of drywall to throw out the wet insulation. Ugh. And also, the uh, crawl space below the house filled with water, <laughs> so all the ductwork the Air oh. conditioning, heating ductwork, which is insulated, filled with water. Mm. All right, so I had to take all of that out. Ugh. And I had two kayaks stored under the house. <laughs> they filled with water, so I had to pump the water out before I could get them out. I have a picture mm. I took of them under the house. It was so oh. eerie. I grabbed one of them. I'm like, whoa, this is cemented to the floor because <laughs> I didn't see the water. <laughs> it was so weird. So we spent two days this week throwing out stuff and up and down our block – is what everyone's doing, just throwing out stuff onto the sidewalk, and the town is picking it up. But there are some houses that are totally wiped out. The porches are ripped off. A lot of sinkholes um, opened up underneath some of these houses. I guess there was erosion underneath the sand for some reason, and the houses just collapsed into them. Wow. Really, wow. really pretty bad. Yeah. So the whole island is shut down. You're not allowed on it. They have police everywhere. They have these remote uh, police trailers, you know, running on generators with, with radar things on top. And it's really eerie because there's nobody around except people cleaning out their houses. So Right. This is pretty new for us. I mean, we never had a, hur- a hurricane do this much damage. So, Is the structure cool. of your place okay? Seems to be okay, yeah. Structure's fine. Everything is okay. It's just to, it took on it. A bit of water, but it'll be fine. You know, we'll Did the watering it. get up to your wiring? So we have two houses on the property, the main house, and then there's a little cottage in the back where we, we, we put guests. And in there, the water went above the electrical outlets. Ah. So we have to replace those. But the wiring is just a plastic-coated stuff, so it's okay. Right. And that's where we had to take the drywall off to uh, get at the insulation. Otherwise, you get mold in the wall, and then you know it's. Oh yeah. I mean, we had to throw the fridge out. We had to we had to take the cabinets off the wall to get behind. You know, we took all the rug out, threw it out, and a lot of stuff we just threw. we took the opportunity to throw things out that we should have thrown out years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a good part of it, I guess. Yeah. But the cool thing is, here you have have all these neighbors. Most of them I never talked to, and now you're in this situation together. All of a sudden, you're you're friends. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting how disaster brings brings people together anyway i hope it doesn't happen again uh the interesting part is i forgot to renew my flood insurance a couple years ago oh Oh. so i'm in big trouble at home as you can imagine because i paid too much attention to virology and not my (laughs) my own business but and it turns out that the, the the um 
the premiums would have probably been more than the repairs are going to cost. So, okay, uh, that's your story, and you're sticking to it. Yeah, yeah that's my story. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. honey, we saved money. <laughs> yeah, we did save money. I was so yeah, I was crawling under there, pulling out those ducks. It was pretty interesting. Oh, one more thing. So we we got in on a bus on Monday. They had you couldn't drive in on Monday. So they, you stopped on the mainland, you got on a school bus, and they drove you in. You worked for a couple hours, and you went back out again. On the way out, the, they made all vehicles pass through this um, this contraption that sprayed the sides of the vehicle. I don't know what they were spraying it with. You know, It could have been to decontaminate it. It could have been just to get the dust off, although the bus wasn't very dusty. So I don't know, but that was interesting. Mm. Mm. I, don't know. Yeah, I wonder what they're worried about drink, uh, dragging back in. I don't know. Mm. You know, you're not supposed to drink the water at the moment because uh, the suspect has to be tested first. And yeah, maybe it was just some kind of um, disinfectant. I don't know. But it wouldn't be very efficient. I mean, it kind of, no. you know, yeah. half sprayed the, the bus and you didn't even get on the top of it. But Good right thing you're not a conspiracy shoes. theorist. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> I am not. Anyway, that's part two of Sandy. So uh, in, in the meantime, I don't have internet yet at home. So, oh man! Uh, the power went up, as I <laughs> said, a week ago Saturday. Uh, Comcast was there last week. They put all their wires up. But we don't have Comcast now. I'm waiting for Verizon. So ah. I don't know what, what's the, but it's interesting how I do most of my work at home uh, on the internet, and I can't do it. I have to work here. Be very efficient. <laughs> Change things. Okay. Uh, thanks for um, listening. And that's it for TWIV 207. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I forgot to tell everyone that this episode of TWIV is sponsored by ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, the world's largest membership society for microbiologists. Find out how ASM membership can help advance your science, your career, and your network. Go to asm.org slash advance. ASM is doing a membership drive till the end of the year. They have a really good deal for students. It's like $20 a year for membership. So you ought to check that out. Are you a member of ASM, Matt? Uh, I think I am. It helps with publishing publishing costs on papers, so I yeah, think I am. Yeah, it does. It'll give you a better rate. And I'm a, a lifetime member of ASV now. Well, you're a wealthy guy, aren't you? Yeah. for you. It's very good. I, was, I thought of doing that. How many years have you paid your $100 fee? I don't want to calculate it. <laughs> I, I already screwed up on the flood insurance. <laughs> so I, It'll save you money. Don't worry. Well, I, I was a member since, I don't know, maybe 90, so 10, 20, let's say 20, 20 years. All right, so you paid $2,200 in yeah. your yearly ASV fee. And the so lifetime for, membership is what? $1,000. Yeah, but I need to get another 10 years out of it to make it worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows if I will, right? <laughs> I figure I'm in it for the long haul. I'll you are. It. You're a young guy. Yeah. yeah. You're a young guy. I'm an old guy. Okay. A couple of follow-ups, both from Stephen. I believe it's the same Stephen. First one, the Henrietta Lacks mural I sent to Twiv as a listener pick was also picked up by the Murals Sponsoring Foundation and featured in a slide on their home webpage, opef.org. It's the second slide in the group thought you might like to know because they also reference This Week in Virology on the slide, which is great. Cool. Uh, So this is uh, cool. This, I didn't know. This was my pick of the week in the uh, Harmit Malik episode. And um, the sponsor of the mural was the Oak Park Education Foundation, I suppose. You must know about that, Kathy. Um, I didn't know about that foundation, but I did try really hard that week to look at the mural online, and I wasn't able to get to it. So I'm really glad that we now have this link to it, and you can take a look at it. Although it kind of it's a slideshow, so it keeps switching really quickly. You have to keep <laughs> clicking back on that second slide, but yeah, uh, it's better than not being able to see it at all. Yeah, it's it, it's weird. He had given me a couple of links, and he wanted to use this one. And you have, for this one, you have to install Silverlight, which is some Microsoft yeah. thing. Right, uh, right. I did that, and it still didn't, didn't work. work. So, yeah, it's a cool mural, though. It is, and it's very nice that they mentioned Twiv. So, thank you, Oak Park Education Foundation. That's cool. Uh, also, let's see. Okay, also from Steve. Yes, this is in reference to last week's Twiv. 
when we talked about stem cell reprogramming. I noticed the Jove site was a pick in TWIV number 92, but if you have not seen this article to follow up the last podcast, I thought you might like to. So it's a video on generation of induced pluripotent stem cells by reprogramming with a four-transcription factor system. Uh, Jove is uh, videos of techniques, so I suppose they, they show you how to do it there. Journal of Visualized Experiments. Right. All right. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Steve, for that. We have two papers today. And if you noticed, Rich Condit is not here. I think he's racing a sailboat or sailing somewhere on a sailboat, right? <laughs> well, at least I saw on Facebook he's sending pictures of this thing. So he's probably going to text us in the middle of the episode again. Yeah, right. Like, ha ha. Ha ha. <laughs> Look where I'm, I am. I'm <laughs> sailing a boat in warm tropical waters. Yeah. <laughs> I hope he sends the temperature this time, though. Yeah. Uh, the first paper was sent in last week, if you remember, to have 206 from our listener, Allison. Uh, this is Allison from the Barrick Lab, right, Matt? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and this is um, stabilization of vaccines and antibiotics in silk and eliminating the cold chain. It's a PNAS paper from Zhang Pritchard, Hu, Valentin Penelitis, Omenetto, and Kaplan. Very interesting story. Silk has always been a expensive and treasured commodity and now it may even be more so well it's already used in medicine extensively what do you use it for in medicine sutures really yeah i thought there were some polymer that dissolves is that silk uh, a lot of them are silk yeah it was some are or some kind some of are plastic, some are other right? are other polymers but it's a it's a an amazing material anything else it's used for uh, i think there might be some stuff that's the one that I thought of immediately. I guess it's it's still used for clothing, right? Well, yes. Although yeah. not in stockings anymore, right? It's also used in tissue engineering, the uh, scaffold things. Ah, right. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think the purpose of here is there. It's a great matrix, right? So that's the idea. Yeah, you can fold it. You, I mean, you can melt it into any different type of yeah form, and it uh, still works the same way. The whole idea here is they want to, well, as everyone knows, we've talked about this a lot on TWIV, uh, to keep vaccines thermostable, you have to keep them cold. You have to maintain a cold chain. And uh, this is a problem in many underdeveloped countries, of course, that don't have a, an, a good cold chain, or if they do, the, the electricity is unstable. So they make some interesting points in the introduction about how much money is lost by... Uh, problems with the cold chain. Cold chain alone can account for 80% of the cost of vaccination, uh, 200 to 300 million dollars a year. I like or this. About one tenth what we just spent on an election in this country. That's right. <laughs> it, it failures in the cold chain results in waste of or loss of nearly half of all global vaccines. Half. That's a lot. Yeah. I like this sentence. Deficiencies in the process frequently occur even in industrialized countries. And that reminds me of what happened here in New York City to New York University. Did we mention that last time? No. Oh, no, I don't think so. So NYU uh, Medical Center, which is here in the city downtown, they were flooded because they're right on the East River and there's a huge storm surge. Uh, their animal facility is in the basement of one of their research buildings. It flooded and all the, all the mice drowned. 7,500 mice, I think. The generators... The backup generators were also in the basement, and they were fouled. I think there, were, there was one generator on the roof of one of the buildings, but the pump to, to bring the fuel to the generator was in the basement. So that got flooded and failed. So there was a chain of terrible events. And this is an industrialized city, as you know. Yep. And so you lose power, you lose a lot of stuff, and they lost all their minus 20, minus 70 freezer content. It's all gone. Do you know anybody that was hit by it? Uh, Ian Moore, his lab. And oh, by yeah. the way, they can't go back to their labs for a couple of weeks because the building is uh, is a mess and it's not safe and so forth. There's no power. So they're shut out. Can you imagine? You're shut out of your lab for a month. Yeah. And, students, and by the way, you just lost all of your reagent, samples, yeah. and all of your mice, and all of your reagents. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's just sitting home. and So I know Ian Moore, um, a couple of other people, Noko Tanisi, another one. Um 
my friend Bob Schneider, who is a scientist there, uh, moved his labs a couple of weeks ago to a different building, which did not have a problem, so he was lucky. Wow. But there are quite a few people, microbiology uh, department mainly. I suppose mm-hmm. this happened in uh, New Orleans as well years ago, right, for Katrina to some people. Yeah. Um, right. And there was a big that. loss in Houston, Houston too, of right? mice. Yeah. yeah. So this some. happens. People recover, but it's costly and it takes time. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. That, that was a little divergent to show, just to remind everyone of this incident here in New York. It's pretty bad. In fact, Rebecca Skloot tweeted about it, right, Matt? The NYU yeah, absolutely. Because you retweeted. There's been a bunch of articles about the NYU case, and it, it, it's Hulk harkens to the other. It was a minus eighty freezer that had a bunch of um, autism brain sections in it. Uh-huh. It was like two hundred. It was like this, a giant collection of two hundred or something uh, brains of autistic kids, and the gone. freezer went down, and they lost all the samples. Not because of a storm, just because the freezer went down. Yeah. So, yeah, as much as you can put everything on backup power, it still doesn't always help you. Well, today's paper is not going to solve that, but it may help uh, stabilizing vaccines and antibiotics. So that the idea here is that you could use silk, which is a protein polymer from the silkworm, and it uh, has incredible properties. It can be formed in films or gels or spheres, and it makes a structure that stabilizes molecules. It it par- does it, I think, in a variety of ways. Maybe you know more about this than I do, Alan. Is is that um, fair to say? Yeah, so they it they go into some some description of the physical nature of this thing, but um it's it's a block copolymer, uh which means you have uh, a sequence uh, it, sequences are in blocks so you have a hydrophobic sequence and then a short hydrophilic sequence hydrophobic sequence short hydrophilic sequence this folds into a beta sheet and then those beta sheets um, go into larger structures and this type of thing is also uh, uh, block copolymers are a huge area of research now in all sorts of, of materials developments including things like cell matrices and and what have you Um and here we've got a naturally occurring one that happens to have a lot of the same characteristics that people are trying to fine tune in laboratory ones. Um, so the argument is that it, well, it's already known to to stabilize some things. I think some people have done some mm-hmm. experiments stabilizing enzymes on silk films and on silk nanoparticles. Of course, nanoparticles are all the rage now in whatever form. Um, and the idea is, well, okay, if it stabilizes enzymes, why not other things? Why not antibiotics? Why not uh, uh, vaccines? Because those are things we really need to stabilize. Mm. So I, my understanding is this the silk keeps the moisture content down, which is part of the reason why you lose activity. And also locks the proteins in a way that prevents transitions so they don't denature as readily. Right. So things can't denature as easily, they can't clump as easily, and they don't get as much water absorbing into them because you've got these large hydrophobic structures. So why does a silk worm need this, this amazing protein? This is just what it spins its cocoon out of. And it happens to have these amazing properties. Yeah, I guess guess a cocoon... is uh, it has to be it has to be water resistant it has to be obviously biocompatible um it's a protective case and it probably has to not taste very good to predators <laughs> it's really cool yeah it, i mean it has to stay out of the environment for whatever length of time the yeah yeah the caterpillar is cocooning right so it's amazing so uh what they did here was to look at the ability of silk Silk fibroin, basically, we'll call silk, to stabilize an antibiotic, and they looked at penicillin and tetracycline, and also a vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella, MMR vaccine, Um, with the idea being that if it stabilizes these, then you could use it, and you would not need a uh, cold chain, or if the cold chain failed, it would be uh, not so much of a problem. Right. So they... Start with the antibiotics, which is not this week in virology, but it's an interesting story anyway. <laughs> they they mix the, the antibiotics with silk, and they make films. And you can do this by air drying or lyophilizing. Uh, and then they 
subject the preparations to different temperatures for long periods of time, and then at each time point they, they do a bioassay. So for the antibiotics, they look for inhibitory ability. And it's really amazing, the, <laughs> the presence of silk. So normally in, in solution, um, the tetracycline dies in a week or so, depending right. on the temperature. Especially at 60 degrees centigrade, it's gone in a week. And what is it, 37 degrees, you've got about half of the activity in a week. You know, it goes less at 20 and less at 4. But 4 is good. That's what you store it at, I suppose. You get a little bit of decrease in 4 weeks. But when you put the, uh, the silk in with it, man, it's amazing. You now, at 60 degrees, uh, 4 months, you have about what looks like about 90% of activity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. The lower 37 degrees, similar findings. At six months, it goes down. But, but still, four months at 60 degrees C. It's that's, incredible. That's ridiculous. I mean, it's really holding the compound in a way that, that it's not breaking down. So Now, what wasn't really clear to me, maybe I needed to delve more into the materials and methods, but was whether this version that they put into the silk film was actually a dosable version. Because they're comparing it to an aqueous solution of tetracycline that you could presumably actually give somebody. Oh, I see. Or whether you would have to rehydrate this. Because if you have to rehydrate it, then we get to the comparison uh, with powders, which is not quite as flattering. Mm. Well, the way they do it, of course, is it's kept at the high temperature as a film or a powder, and then they rehydrate it to do the right. assay, right? Right. So if you if you have to rehydrate it, speaking of getting these things to distant destinations in the third world, um, then you need somebody who can rehydrate it under sterile conditions and put it into a needle and inject it. So you, so you wouldn't yeah. be able to just hand this out in that format. Or could um, you take? I mean, there, could you take it as a pill in that sense? You know? I don't know. That was what I was wondering: is whether you could just swallow the silk. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, they, well, work, I looked up. Yeah. It's, they they cite a paper. It's a paper about how they make the silk. And they're actually from silkworm cocoons, mm-hmm. right? That they wash and boil and extract the silk out of, hmm. and then you're left with a uh, solid material. Yeah. So it's natural, at least. I mean, if they and if it's the same kind of silk they use for um, sutures and stuff, then it should be totally biodegradable. Right. You remember we did a similar story about vaccine stabilization a while ago on TWIV, where they use sugar complexes to stabilize vaccines yeah so in that case the the vaccine is sort of dried and embedded into this sugar and they they divide they put that into a cassette that you just attach to a needle and then you force um, the diluent through and it dissolves it and and then it gets injected right you know so you don't have to add a certain amount of water you just put the, the syringe on so that may be a solution too i mean in in any case you have to rehydrate on site right yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, but if you're but if you're storing if you're rehydrating on site, um, and you're comparing this to uh, to the status quo, which would be to ship powdered tetracycline, right? Um, this figure one uh, parts D through G, that's not quite as impressive as the the liquid version storage right. difference. I mean, they're seeing a little bit of improvement with the silk um, the silk and powder form. Or compared to the powdered form, but it's not huge. That's why it's figure one. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we're going to get to the good stuff. The good stuff yeah, is good next. Stuff. Now we do uh, MMR vaccine. Yeah. Now this this is the money shot. So here here you uh, <laughs> they lyophilize or make a, a film, uh, an air dried film with the vaccine, and then subject it to different temperatures. Uh, I guess up to 25 weeks right? here at 4 degrees or 25, 37, and 45. And then at each time point, they, um, they dissolve the, uh, the film, the silk film, and then they assay for the presence of uh, a virus. Now, I have to say that what they did is, there's a quote in the methods here, which I highlighted. Viral infectivity was evaluated using a quantitative real-time RT-PCR viral infectivity assay. Now, that's a little bit of a contradiction, right? Because the RT-PCR assay is not an infectious right. virus assay. So what they looked at is viral RNA, 
and they they report it as residual potency, but wait, no? wait. In the supporting information, it does sound like the virus was allowed to replicate in the cells, mm-hmm. and then the RNA was isolated and quantitated using qPCR. Uh, so their so their yeah, assay was not a plaque assay, but it was an RT. Okay, right. So this is a really bad description of it here in the methods then. Right, in the expanded methods, there's better. More. Okay, so they do look at infectivity. Right. Yes. But uh, they're assaying it not by a plaque assay, but by RT-PCR. But by RT-PCR. Which is unfortunate, right. but anyway. 40, but it's a, it seems like a legitimate way. You're, you you know you're getting a live virus out. So. Right. Infectious. Yeah, right. it's okay. I just don't know why. I know I mean, you like plaque assays. Well, I think people, <laughs> you know, the RT-PCR is a lot faster than a plaque assay. Yeah. So, fine, but hey, you know, if you can do a plaque assay... You're really good. <laughs> Four degrees. Measles, mumps, rubella, they are separately assayed. It's because a three trivalent vaccine. They assay each component. And four degrees, they're pretty stable, except mumps at 25 weeks goes down to about 80%. And 25 degrees, they, the three components have slightly different stabilities. But the silk stuff, the silk preserved stuff, is always really near 100 between... Uh, 80 and 100%. Never, never goes below 90 as far as I can tell. 37 degrees is really when you see the first big difference because uh, they're all about less than 20% after 25 weeks, but the silk preparations are still way up there, and it also at 45 degrees centigrade. Yeah. yeah. 25 weeks, uh, you still have greater than 80% potency. It's really amazing. Yeah, and looking at earlier time points... Um, you know, I would say the at 45C, the vaccine is pretty much unusable by by a little after a month, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. You know, because a couple of components are way down below 50%, you wouldn't want to give that vaccine. Whereas the lyophilized silk version is just chugging along. There's just no sign of, I mean, it's a very, very slight decline to maybe 90% for some components yeah. at 25 weeks, which is ridiculous. They say in this in the text that this the manufacturer says when you reconstitute the vaccine, so it comes in the vial is dried, you reconstitute it with buffer. If you don't use any in, within eight hours, you have to throw it out. Right, and they do the reconstitution. Once they reconstitute it, things are not quite as good. Oh yeah, sure, but sure. the whole point is to be able to store it, right? To get it there, yeah. exactly. The problem that we that that these vaccination campaigns have now is you've got to transport this vaccine to right. the corners of the earth and and you just can't keep it refrigerated the whole time. Yeah, and then when you get there, if the electricity goes, you know, all these things happen, if it's lyophilized in silk, it may, may be better for it in the long run. Yeah, yeah. and maybe sitting in a warehouse that gets up to 38C or 40C right. during the day and, and yeah. apparently this thing would be just fine. Yeah. Yeah, and you just now send it as two components, one of water and yeah. or saline and yeah. one as a vial with your silk um, yeah. prep in it. And then you squirt the aqueous solution in, redissolve, and inject yeah. in. Yeah. But again, you have to – once you add your aqueous solution, that's it. There's no more sure. preservation by right. silk, right? Right. But that's why those needles that you described, Vincent, yeah. might be really good if it's just, it just – it together, reconstitutes yeah. right then and then – Stick it into the patient. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole lot going on with delivery systems like that that could really, really address that I, part of it. I wondered. So, I mean, obviously they have to do more here, including um, w- making sure the silk is not interfering with the antigenicity in any way, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, I guess you can inject silk into people without an issue because you have they're in sutures already, right, Alan? Yeah. Right, and I looked up, they they referenced a couple of papers about the inflammatory responses to silk in vitro and in vivo, and um, low level of inflammatory potential of silk fibers makes them promising candidates, says one of them, and yeah. um, purified degradable silk is biocompatible, so yeah, not perfect, because they, they do say a little bit of inflammatory tissue reaction, but... Um, but still quite good. So they'll have to do a clinical trial to address right. these issues. Sure. Right. Yeah, and this this paper doesn't do any – we have no idea what the antigenic response is to these vaccines because right. we don't have any animals in the in the paper or anything no. like that. This was just to look at stability, which is pretty right. impressive. Which is very impressive, yeah. yes. 
Uh, they do some experiments which suggest that the mechanism is, as we discussed before, that the moisture content is is reduced in the presence of silk, and also there's a the silk provides structural stability so that they don't um, thermally denature. Yeah, they actually do quite a well. What I would consider quite a bit of physics. Yeah. Here, um, mm-hmm. I had to go look up differential scanning calorimetry and um, glass transitions, and, and they go. They really <laughs> try. And, they, they really try and figure out um, uh, why the, these silk films. I mean, they have a theory, but then they they try and work it out. Um, and it looks like with the with the conventional lyophilized vaccine, I guess the it, it has this kind of complex transition that goes on as you raise the, raise the temperature, where the viral particles they think that the viral particles are aggregating, mm-hmm. and that may be one of the reasons that the vaccine goes down in activity because the particles have the, the proteins on the surface have denatured partly and then stuck together and aggregated aggregated into this glob of particles that can't then subsequently attach to cells. Um, Whereas when it's on silk, you get that aggregation takes a much higher temperature, that transition takes a much higher temperature, and that may be keeping the particles separate so that they can still yeah. start a productive infection. Mm-hmm. This is from a Department of Biomedical Engineering at Tufts. Yeah. This is what you do as a biomedical engineer. You do stuff like this. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I wonder if there's also a friction issue between the particles you know, in a vial that at some level there's interactions, you know, kind of contacting between all the particles and maybe, and maybe that friction also causes breakdown. So by eliminating the friction, by embedding them in this, um, silk film, you actually, that's also part of the stabilization. Yeah. Could be, no, they don't mention that, but maybe you have, you know, the outsider's insight, Matt. I don't, there you go. Call me. <laughs> so the idea would be that putting silk underwear on the virus keeps it from chafing. <laughs> there you go. That is a title. <laughs> That's a, you got to work that into a title now. I, I riffed a little bit on silk. And I know so. it's very good. I like that. Okay, anything else we need to uh, mention here that I missed or we missed? No, it's I would like to say one thing. There's a um, there's actually a guy here at University of Maryland that I know named Frank Robb who is working on vaccine uh, stability as well. Mm-hmm. And so in his model, he actually expresses heat shock proteins from thermophiles in the attenuated vac- uh, live attenuated vaccines mm-hmm. as a way to stabilize um, wow. the vaccines. And they work really well. He has a Gates grant. And um, so it's basically looking at thermophilic heat shock proteins that have to stabilize the thermophiles. And by mm-hmm. putting those into another context, context, it actually stabilizes the other proteins that are around it. So That's cool. I think, yeah, it's really neat. Uh, I've heard it talk a couple of times. So they're... Um, there, uh, there's a lot of people working on this, I think, and, and hopefully there's money to support this because this, I mean, this is very important, obviously. Mm-hmm. I, I yeah. was, I looked immediately in the acknowledgments because I said, oh, this has got to be a grant, uh, a Gates grant, but it's not; it's an AH grant. But Gates provides a lot of funding for that sort of thing that you're just talking about, and that's yeah. good to take these kind of risky approaches. So, would a heat shock protein be a problem to inject into people? It would be uh, immunogenic, I guess, right? Yeah, I, maybe it's an adjuvant. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah you're not <laughs> it, immunogenicity true. is not really a problem for vaccines necessarily, unless it yeah, really no, causes the inflammation reaction. is good. That could give you yeah. a better yeah. response mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in all of a sudden in um, this kind of st- stabilization of vaccines as we realize that if we could make them work and be a little more stable globally, we would have a better shot at really reducing infectious diseases so yeah do you know i mean i don't know if any of these authors are virologists at all but i mean i'm what i'm hoping and i think people are seeing their way to survive in science is to to cross these disciplines so these are probably engineers and bi- biomedical engineers that are dipping in their normal uh, expertise into a biological question so yeah crossing those boundaries is where you make the interesting findings mm-hmm. yeah i think virologists should should take that to heart that you should cross away from your comfort zone and do stuff like this maybe do practical stuff that you would previously think you know is not worth your attention but can really have a big yield in the end and is can really be supported 
Yeah, mm-hmm. and you don't have to do it alone because this looks like a fairly yeah. significant collaboration. And I'm sure there are folks on the team who are sort of struggling with the biology and folks who are struggling with the physics, and they can they can collaborate, get yeah. this sort of thing done. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. So continuing now on the vaccine theme, we have a sec. Our second paper is also about vaccine development. This is from Nature Medicine, and this is why Matt is here as our subject expert. It's called a live impaired fidelity coronavirus vaccine protects in an aged immunocompromised mouse model of lethal disease. And the authors are Graham, Becker, Eckerly, Bowles, Dennison, and Barrick. And that's your old lab, Matt. Yeah. So I was in Ralph Barrick's lab for my postdoc. Um, and so Rachel Graham, the first author, is a postdoc in, in Ralph's lab. Um, Megan Bowles is a MD-PhD grad student uh, doing her PhD in Ralph's lab. And then Michelle Becker and Lance Eckerly are, um, uh, I guess they're both postdocs at the moment uh, in Mark Dennison's lab. Um, and Mark mm-hmm. and Ralph have had a long-term collaboration for most of their careers on coronavirus stuff. Mark being at uh, Vanderbilt, right? Right. So Mark's at Vanderbilt and, and Ralph's at UNC. So was this work ongoing when you were in the lab or is this more recent? Yeah, no, there's there's a bit of a history to the project. Um, but yeah, the, Rachel had been working on this uh, exonuclease mutant for a while. Actually, she started in when she was... A, she, so the connection is Rachel, the first author, was actually a grad student in Mark Dennison's lab. And then she went to Ralph Barrick's lab for a postdoc. Okay. So um, she was a really good grad student. And Ralph was you know, obviously very happy to have her in the lab for his her postdoc. And yeah. so she took, a, she took some projects with her and just continued the collaboration going from more in vivo stuff to in vivo stuff. So we actually did a TWIV on a paper from the Denison lab about XON, this exonuclease encoded in the coronavirus genome. Oh, good. Uh, a long time ago. It was actually, the name of the episode was An Hour with Dr. Kiki. Oh, that one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we, uh, is Kiki um, Kirsten Sanford, and we actually talked about this paper. I think it was a PLOS pathogens paper where he showed that, um, you know, this this protein had XO activity, and then he speculated that it had something to do with RNA proofreading. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it was a PLOS pathogens paper. I have it pulled up. Yeah, so Lance Eckerly was the first author on that paper. Okay. Where they did, um, they they made, they initially made the mutants, this NSP14 exonuclease mutant in SARS, and they did all the in vitro work to show that, it actually was mutagenic, and they did all these passage experiments to show that you got increased repl- um, mutation rate when you had the mutations, um, and then showed upon passage how they did a lot of deep sequencing and basically basically created a deep sequencing platform to be able to uh, identify mutant uh, mutations that occurred across the genome during uh, passage. So the idea here, Matt, is that the corona genome is so big that it it's an RNA virus, so it's going to make a lot of errors. It has to have some way to keep the error rate down, otherwise it wouldn't survive, right? Exactly. And so this is where this exonuclease called XON comes in. The idea, when it was discovered, people said, aha, this must have something to do with proofreading, right? Right. Um, so how would it work? It would be cutting out mistakes? Is that where the XO fun- – it's a 3' prime to 5' prime XO. Right. And the yeah, so that's, I mean, no, no one really knows mechanism, I think, at the moment, as far yeah. as I can know. Um, but yeah, the idea is that if you, um, the idea is that basically coronaviruses are 30,000 base pair RNA viruses. They're the largest RNA virus um, family. And then there's basically a drop between 30 KB down to 15 to 20 KB. Basically, everything else is 15 and lower. Mm-hmm. So when they did a lot of phylogeny, they noticed that one of the additions to the genomes of these larger viruses was this protein called the head, um, which they call NSP14, NSP which is our creative nomenclature for Cronus. Um, but it's an XON function, so it's an exonuclease function. And so the idea is that by gaining the exonuclease um, capabilities as part of your polymerase, you can actually be more f- higher fidelity, and that can help you make your genome bigger um, mm. to gain more function. So is the idea that the polymerase recognizes the, the mismatch, or is it just not known? Yeah, it's, re- it's, it's really not known. I mean, it is an exonuclease. That the, 
this protein has been shown to be part of the um, polymerase yeah. and uh, how it actually functions in vitro on a replicating machinery is not really. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was wondering if you put this XON gene into one of those smaller RNA viruses that has a higher mutation rate than coronas. I wonder if it would have any effect or on its own, it just wouldn't do anything. That's a good question. I, I, so I did this paper for our virology class uh, journal club for my SARS lecture. And that, that's one of the students exactly the exact same question. Yeah. So I think it's a good question. You're, you're on the game. Thank um, you. Yeah, Thank I don't you. know. I should be after 59 years. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. I don't know if you, if you need specialized machinery to you know, show the interaction, yeah. like maybe yeah. you could evolve the interaction in some system. Um, but, uh, but at, at least the coronas that are out there uh, all have this function. Okay. Um, and one of the really amazing things is that before Mark's paper started looking at uh, replication rate or, or, or fidelity of coronas, it was thought to be a much worse virus than, or at least a, a yeah, more, yeah. much worse polymerase than was known. And then what Mark started doing deep sequencing was really where the first time you started getting the real numbers, um, it dropped from... You know, ten to the sixth, ten to the seventh, ten to the eighth, or sorry, ten to the fourth or ten to the fifth, which was the um, normal rate for RNA viruses. It it showed that the coronas really went to ten to the sixth or minus six or minus seventh um, errors per base. So mm -hmm. um, it really was kind of an amazing jump for the field to know that coronas really weren't as, at least uh, polymerase wise, weren't as um, as bad at doing proofreading as it was thought. Right. So if you, what, what Dennison and uh, Graham showed in that paper is that if you, you can actually delete the XON and the virus is viable, but it just makes more mutations, right? Yeah, I don't think you can delete it, but you can make point mutations in the, um, okay. in the active site. So you still need the protein there. Most of the replicase proteins in, in coronas you can't delete or else the virus is not right. functioning. You, you inactivate the XON. You inactivate yeah. it, yeah. So and so you're knocking it down to some lower level of activity, basically. But presumably, after a certain number of passages, that mutant virus would would no longer be viable, right? It would accumulate so many mutations in its genome. Right. Or the other side of it would be maybe it's just actually makes it higher pathogenicity, pathogenicity because you're evolving a bigger swarm and more capability of mutation, which means yeah. you're increasing your amount of of um, of your mutation rate, which you know potentially makes a worse, a, a, a more lethal virus, not a less lethal virus. Right, but in cell culture, has, has someone done that experiment in cell culture? Just pass the mutant with the inactivated XON and see how long you can sustain that passage cell to cell. Uh, yeah, that was that that was that they did in the first in Lance's first paper. And it will it, the virus is still infectious after so many passages. Right. I mean. 10 is, I mean, I would say, what about a 50 or 100 passes? Is the virus enough to last that long? Or? Yeah, I don't know if they've gone that far. Because I'm thinking, you know, polio, for example, is at the edge of its um, mutagenesis rate, right? If you push it over very little in the terms of the number of mutations per base per genome, the, the virus is dead. You can use a, a mutagen to do that, right? Like ribavirin. Right. So here, the XON mutations are sort of like ribavirin. You're pushing the mutation rate up, and the question is, how close to the error threshold is the, is coronavirus? It sounds like it's pretty far away. Uh, yeah, no, it's definitely far away. In, in in Lance's old paper, they basically show that you can't get as high of a of an of a titer off of the XON mutant when you mm -hmm. actually make that virus. We so the Barrick and Denison labs have a reverse genetic system for SARS that Ralph created. Mm -hmm where they can put these mutations in, and then so you make the infectious clone, and then you put that into your, your P0 cell, right. and then you do passages. And, and so basically in the paper they show passage four, you, you start tailing off in your, in your amount of virus that comes out. So yeah. um, you only get to 10 to the sixth versus 10 to the eighth, basically. Yeah. Now, like if you seven. did that experiment, you're talking about it reducing the, the pathogenicity, and we're going to get into that with this paper. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, just hypothetically, if they had done that experiment and it had increased the pathogenicity, um, what kind of headlines would we have had? <laughs> I just blame Ralph. Yes, Make it, making Ralph a deadlier Ralph. SARS. I'm just wondering <laughs> you know, how uh, that would yes. go over. Yeah, but of course, I, I, you have to you have to do these experiments in order to get the answer. And it turns out, in this case, the answer is one that we really like. 
Yeah, I mean, in other systems where they've done it for polio, right? This is about Raul Landino's work where they made a fidelity mutant and which was le- le- less fidelity and it started going away, right? Or they, they actually showed that in um, uh, Julie Pfeiffer's work showed that the, uh, if you put it into an or you know, you inject it into a mouse, it doesn't spread. So you, or, so you need these, you, you need, you need loss of fidelity to actually make a good swarm. Right. And you, over, you make a bigger sequence space that that virus can sample. But you need to be, at some threshold, good enough to keep the, all the real stuff you need uh, alive right, right. and working. So wh- what's the logic in making a vaccine candidate with, this, with XON inactivated? Right. So the logic is that um, you can layer this on other, basically, inactivating or, or impairing mutations that we've, Ralph's lab's been working on. Um, as a way to make a less fit virus. So if you have if you're, you're less fidel if if you have less fidelity of your of your replication, you're going to make more mutations per round, which means that you're going to get less fit virus out, and it's going to um, slow it down. It's going to allow for the immune response to take hold and clear the virus. Which is actually kind of the opposite of what you might see with a smaller RNA virus, where the high the high mutation rate is part of the survival strategy. Right, but if you then kick it up higher, it's bad. Right, right. So right. The, the viruses, depending on the size of their genome, they're operating within a narrow range of, of acceptable values, and if you get them outside that range in either direction, then they're not going to do as well. Right, right. And then the other part of this is that if you can show it for SARS, what other viruses can you now attenuate in the exact same way that have homologous proteins to make other vaccines, and is this um, is this a really kind of beautiful vaccine platform that you can broad you can broaden out to other um, other pathogens? So, right. are you saying though that it, that's only going to work for RNA viruses that have an exonuclease activity, or is it a, something you could target just to their polymerase itself? Right. So, I mean, I think for RNA viruses, it's going to have to be the ones that actually have the activity. Um, for DNA viruses, a lot of them have the same activity as well, and so you could, you know, use this model in DNA viruses as well as another attenuation platform. Um, and what Ralph's lab has done over the years has shown, um, I mean, when I was there and, and since I left, has shown other ways of attenuating viruses. So you can, it's really easy to make a mouse um, protected against SARS. We have dozens of vaccine platforms in the freezer that can do that. But so what the idea is that you can start layering these things on top of each other. And so at the end of this, um, at the end of a passage experiment, you get from the XON, XON mutant, you get um, dozens and dozens and dozens of mutations in the genome, which make it less fit when compared to a wild type virus. So then what Ralph's also shown is that you can um, basically block recombination between two different SARS viruses based on the way they replicate. It's not worth going into now, but here's a nice paper if anyone wants to find it, wants to look it up. Um, and so if you layer that kind of recombination block on top of the XON mutation, on top of deleting other pathogen or virulence factors that we've identified over the years, could you then make an attenuated virus that really could be used as an actual vaccine in people at some point? Mm-hmm. So Now, in this paper, that, that, though, they just look at the effect of the XON mutations, right? right? In this paper, it's just the XON, right? And they use this... Sorry, go ahead, Kathy. Well, I was just going to kind of answer my own question because now I remember the very end of the article, they say um, it could encourage the pursuit of fidelity-impairing mutations in replicase proteins of other RNA viruses. So so that implies it doesn't necessarily have to be an RNA virus with an endonuclease if you could somehow just target the replicase. So it it might have quite broad significance. So with, with polio, you can make a one amino acid change in the replicase protein, and that makes um, the polymerase more faithful, makes less mutations. And that virus, as Matt said, is attenuated. So that could be a vaccine candidate also. Right. Similar mm-hmm. idea, yeah. Right, so either either making it more ac- more higher fidelity or lower fidelity would be ways to try and tune the, the virulence. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I, you Depending can go on the trying to get a higher fidelity virus through the FDA, but I'll go with the lower fidelity one for now. Well, right, but if if you have a virus that's relying on low on a naturally low fidelity polymerase like polio, right, 
um, then you increase the fidelity of it, and now suddenly the virus has problems. Right. Exactly right. Now, in, in this paper, they use a this mouse-adapted SARS variant, which you've mentioned before. Right. right? Can you just re- remind us what that is? Sure. So um, they use this something that they call it's mouse adapted SARS coronavirus. Um, it's called MA15. Is the one is the the real the name that we call it in the lab in the paper they called MA um, wild type. Mm-hmm. So uh, the human isolate of SARS uh, that everyone uses or most people use um, or any of the ones that came out of the epidemic in 2003, when you put them into mice, um, standard lab strains of mice, they don't kill the mice. So what was generated, they replicate fine, and they're cleared. In the, and now you have in the lungs. Mouse. They replicate in the lungs, right? They replicate in the lungs, yeah. Respiratory virus replicates in the lungs. Um, and if you, so what Contessa Barrow's lab did at NIH was they did a passage experiment, just like uh, the ferret project. That's why this was, and this was done three years before, or four years before, <laughs> um, where they took, uh, they took the human isolate of SARS, they put it into a Balbsy little white mouse, and then... They, after two days after infection, they took out the lungs, smushed them down, and then put, the, put that supernatant back into a naive mouse. And they did it over and over and over again until you started getting death of the mice after infection. And that virus, that they then took, um, took the lungs out of that final mouse, plaque purified the virus, showed that that one, one purified plaque grown back up could still kill the same mice um, or new mice, and then sequenced it. And there's six amino acid changes in the genome. And that virus took 15 passages before you got a lethal phenotype. So they called MA15. Okay. Um, and then what Ralph's lab did was they took those, that, that sequence of the virus and put those six amino acid changes into the infectious clone and showed that the, just in, in a clean background, just those six amino acid changes were able to kill a Balbsy mouse. Um, and now what we've done is then use that. We've done a lot of studies on the amino acids that the changes occurred in or the, the protein changes occurred in, what those amino acids are doing. Um, and we've used that mouse-adapted virus now for our, all of our other pathogenesis studies. So now we have a, a virus that can kill a mouse if, it, if you put it into a Balbsy mouse. Um, you can make deletions in that virus and show different changes in pathogenesis depending on the things you're deleting. You can put point mutations in. You can put that, that virus into other strains of mice where it doesn't kill. So the, that virus doesn't kill black six mice or 129 mice, so the other standard lab strains we use. Um, they lose weight, but they recover. And now you can look for mutations in the mice that make more severe disease or less severe disease, depending on the background. Right. Now, this raises a problem for vaccine development, though, right? Because if you do experiments like these, where you're, you're attenuating a virus in a mouse-adapted strain, and then you get to the point where you need to move this into humans, where do you go? So this virus still replicates in human cells. Okay. So it's mouse-adapted, but it doesn't, that's only mouse-adapted for death. It doesn't mean that it doesn't infect human cells. Okay, so and we don't a, know we don't know its pathogenicity in humans. No, um, it still infects. It's still a BSL three agent now, a select agent, um, and it doesn't. Uh, it, so it's still using the BL three just like the wild type virus. Uh, so for that reason, it's it's not. There's no. There's there. There were, I would be surprised if it was not as pathogenic in humans as the wild type virus is. Because in, hu- in any human cell line we've used, it replicates pretty well. But if you right. wanted to make a human vaccine, you would not be able to use, obviously, the mouse-adapted strain. You would have to say, let's say an XON right. mutation, you wanted to test it in humans, you'd have to introduce that into the human SARS virus, not the mouse-adapted. And, and, right. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, and I mean, trials. the reason they did it in the mouse-adapted here is so they could do sure. mouse, the mouse yeah, experiments. Some pathogenesis, right. Right. So yeah, I'm just, I, I'm just trying to get my head around how you, make, how you would it make that leap um, to get this to clinical trials, I, I mean, I, I'm imagining somebody walking into the FDA and saying, "Okay, I've got, I've got SARS. I'm pretty sure I've attenuated it. And I'd like to inject it into some people." Well, there are other animal models you can use, right? Matt? Sure, you could go, you could go via primates, but your your first round of volunteers is going to have to be pretty bold. Sure, I, yes, there's going to be other steps of attenuation necessary, not just this one mutation. I would say, sure, right. So putting it, it, it makes it a very fast. I mean, the idea would be that you, if you know enough about the viruses, right? This is the, the NIH pays you to do. If you understand enough about the biology of the virus, you can start making these predictions of what will be important for attenuation, 
Right. And then so you can build these vaccine platforms and show that this model works in multiple viruses so that the next outbreak that comes, you can then jump on it, take the virus, do exactly what you've done in half a dozen other viruses that you know are attenuated and use that as your initial idea or platform for right. vaccine. That's the idea. All right. So this SARS uh, mouse adapted variant uh, with the XON deletion. They do some experiments. They show that it has a replication defect. Um, it accumulates mutations. It has a, they do a lot of deep sequencing and show that it has a higher mutation rate. And I guess these are all the experiments that were done in the original paper, but they're, they're done again here um, because it's a different virus, right? Right. So they redo it in the mouse-adapted work, right. um, in the mouse-adapted background. And then they challenge, they infect mice, and this, right. this virus basically doesn't kill any of the mice, right? Uh, right. Yeah, it's um, it's I I I'm always amazed at it, but yes, it doesn't kill the mice. Um, they're um, they're you know the the Balbsi mouse for us is the most susceptible you know wild type mouse that we have, and um, it doesn't kill them at all. No, so the in one in, in Figure Two A, they're looking at weight loss, so very minor weight loss change yeah. um, at different doses of a, a virus. They use ten to the two, ten to the three, or ten to the four plaque forming units per mouse. Um, and what they show is that 10 to the 4 of the wild type virus, you get severe, you know, 25% weight loss and severe disease. They do recover, but it takes 14 days for them to get back. Whereas in the, um, the mutant virus, even at the highest dose, you get minor weight loss and no, and no disease. Mm. And they also looked at um, the immune response to this thing and, and challenge in old mice. Right. Yeah, that's later. But yes. Right. So that's the idea that, that the... Um, they do. I mean, we can. I don't know if you want to jump there, but they do. Okay, no, you can. You can go in order. Sorry. No, that's okay. But yes, they look at old mice too, which is important because um, the age. One of the important things about finding new vaccines is that it has to work in multiple age groups, and aged humans have a much less robust immune response for various reasons. Right, um, and in fact, for the brunt of the SARS epidemic, right? Yes, exactly right. Right. So, and the. Already, though, in Figure Two E is the survival, and they're they're using the aged mouse groups, but that's the really impressive money figure with respect to survival. So the black squares are the XON mutant, yeah. and they all survive. 100%. Oh, right. Sorry, I forgot C and D were the aged mice, but yeah, the aged mice are there too. But yeah, exactly right. The aged ones all survive. Hmm. Yeah, mice of the world rejoice. <laughs> this is great. They also put this into various immunocompromised mice. Exactly. Like Mice, rag, ragnol mice, and statinol mice. Yeah. So they rag, they do SIDS. Um, skid, yeah. And, skid, sorry, and they do stats. And, and they're, they're all fine, right? They're, they're all fine. I'm really amazed the skids don't lose weight. I asked Rachel about that by email, and she's, they don't know why. But um, I think it's amazing. And, and I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it says a lot about the, I mean, they don't lose weight to the wild type virus. So there's something else going on there, immune wise. Um, but yeah, no, this, this, the, the mutant virus is definitely attenuated. And the, the reason that it's important to have tested these in the immunodeficient mice is because if the virus were able to re revert, that that could be a real problem for immunodeficient individuals. And right. so showing that it doesn't even have that effect is, is a good thing. Right, and exactly. not only immunodeficient individuals, but um, potentially everybody, if you've got... If, if an immunocompromised host can allow the thing to revert and then become and, and then become a carrier for this revertant virus or transmit the revertant virus, then your vaccine could cause an outbreak. Exactly right. Yeah. So that, that's the other problem. And even if you look at the titer that comes out in 3E, um, it's maintained, but it's, uh, it's much, much lower than the wild-type virus. So... Um, you know, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 PFU per gram of lung um, is really pretty low. Yeah, the other, uh, I think, important finding is they're unable to get revertance of exactly. the virus, right? So can, how do they show that, Matt? So they do, um, so what Rachel did was she did, they did passage experiments um, where they took their, their virus, they passaged it, you know, up to eight times um, in in mice, and mm -hmm. then they took those viruses out, and then put them back into old mice right. to look for what to see whether they were 
you know, you basically exactly what you said, where you do you evolve a more pathogenic virus along the way? Um, and you don't. You basically get an attenuated virus, the same one you had at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and they do, she does it, you know, 24 and 40 and 72 hour passages. And the reason I asked her for that, why she did that, the reason was that the idea is that at 24 hours, you, um, the virus is basically going nuts, so you have really rampant replication. And by 72 hours, you should actually have a little bit of immune response or innate response kicking in. So maybe that will change the um, mutation frequency or um, the uh, basically the background of the virus uh, along the way. So you get maybe get two different immune, uh, more mutant populations, but both of them show the same effect. How many amino acid changes are in the XON to inactivate it? Do you know? Two amino acid changes. That's really amazing that it doesn't revert, isn't it? Yeah. And so they, that's one of the things they point out in all the sequencing. They then sequenced a the ton of the viruses along passage and from mice and did all, this, all, the, mm-hmm. all the sequencing on it, which really was a big undertaking. Um, and the XON mutation is still there throughout all of the passages. They never lose it. They never, it never goes back. Which is, is especially remarkable because the mutation increases mutation rate. Yeah. Right. Sure. You've actually upped the odds that you would get revertance, and you've only got two amino acid changes that you need to accomplish, and it's not happening. Right. And I, I think we, we t- I've actually talked about this in my class, um, and we, I mean, we talked about it in the lab before. You, you're probably losing a lot of your mutation swarm because those, there's a lot of, mut- of viruses that are going to be mutated in, in ways that make them dead. So right. they're not going to be passed to the next cell. So you're not going to be able to pass it to those viruses that actually make mutations that are dead. The only viruses you're getting out at the end are ones that have survived all of the other mutational effects in their genome. Right. So, so you've, you've increased, in one sense, you've increased the odds of reverting those, those two mutations that would matter. But the viruses that get reversions in both of those simultaneously would also have to not get lethal mutations elsewhere, and the odds of that are just perhaps too low. Right. Especially with a nice big 30,000 base pair virus. So, right. Um, all so, of that goes in the favor of a good vaccine or a good attenuation at the end. So what you're saying is by the time you would have mutations in XON, reverting mutations, you've, you've had so many mutations elsewhere that those viruses can't survive. Right. Is that right? Yeah. And, and I mean, all of these, all of the RNA viruses, they really depend on their secondary structure of the RNA in the genome for making hairpins that are important for replication, mm. transcription, translation, uh, protein binding. So the secondary structure of the RNAs is actually really critical and has evolved uh, specifically for a reason for that. Like the sequence, the reason you have codon bias and codons uh, in the right place or the, at the, in, the right, uh, in the genome is because even though that same, that same codon can code for alanine four different ways, it needs those mutations and that, in that, I mean, those base pair changes um, or selection in that codon so that it can cause the right secondary structure of the RNA mm-hmm. to do all the other things it needs to do. So by now shifting the, the, the mutation rate and the mutational spectrum across the genome, you're probably mo- really, really changing the secondary structure of the RNA, which again, attenuates you. I just would think that if you had a reversion in XON early on, that should that should predominate because the XON mutant is a really lousy competitor. So you would right. think that a revertment right. would really emerge very early on. So right. I, I, I really don't understand that. You understand why it doesn't happen? Yeah. I mean, despite our discussions, which won't make sense, I would still think that if it reverted really early on, and that can happen sometimes, it would have a huge growth advantage. Yeah, I think the odds just are not high enough for that to happen Maybe. at any I mean, it, obviously, the, you're, you're playing a statistical game, and the odds are never yeah. going to be zero. Right. But they're apparently, I mean, out of, out of all the passages that they did in multiple animals and multiple sequencings and this and that, this thing just doesn't seem to revert. No. I agree. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't put it past a virus to, for it to happen. I mean, I think that's well, sure. one caveat is that yeah. there's, you know, viruses figure out ways to do things. Um, but... And all the evidence so far, and all the passage experiments, and all the MHV work, and the in vitro work for SARS, it doesn't go back. Hmm. Uh, it is two amino acid changes with multiple base pair changes at those positions. So it would take a little bit extra oomph to get it to change. But um, it's not right. It's not. RNA. It's not two base changes. It's two amino acid changes yeah. that it's would. Still, though, it's an RNA virus. You know, they can do right. these things. 
<laughs> well, but it's a, it's an RNA virus that has evolved uh, to require a relatively high fidelity replication. It's true. It's true. And now that's what you've tinkered with, and you've got you've got this low fidelity, which would be this fidelity rate would probably be fine if you were polio virus, but it's got thirty kilobases that it's got to deal with, and it just can't handle that mutation rate. Yeah, I, I mean, what I, what would be interesting to see is if so they have a there's a spartic acid. It's so the the a D to, D to A and a E to A change in the to change the amino acid. So if you made all the other 19 changes at those positions to the other amino acids, could you? Does that are they all attenuating the same way, or are some yeah. you know half as good, half as bad? Yeah. Um, and maybe it needs to be that act. I mean, the active site has evolved obviously for it to be an active site. It's not just a surface structure like an HA. It's an active site, so you need those mutation, those original amino acids there. And if you don't go back to those originals, then you know you're stuck. Yeah. Now, with all that said, I would not, I would not expect anybody to sign off on this as a vaccine with only this XON um, uh, attenuating set of mutations. I mean, that there are other. If you put other attenuating mutations in there for redundancy, that would be a much better approach. Sure. I would agree with you. As long as you don't compromise immunogenicity, right? Right. right. Which is the next experiment here, right? Yes. Right. Good lead-in. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> He's smooth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the last experiment is our vaccination experiment, which is really the key to the whole thing. And so, which is what they're trying to do is make a good vaccine. Um, and so they put in, they take naive mice and they take low passage, um, XON and, and, um, and PBS inoculated mice, um, and they do 12-month-old mice. So this is 12-month-old female biopsies, which we know that the mouse-adapted virus has severe, has really, really high virulence in those mice. Um, and then they challenge them. Uh, I didn't write down how long they waited. Um, they, I'm trying to think how long they wait after they challenge them. Um, so they, they basically inoculate them, and then... They challenge them with the, the wild-type, high-titer, uh, mouse-adapted virus. And then in three days later, they take out the lungs and they look at the titer um, in the lungs. And the ones that were vaccinated with PBS basically were naive. They had really, really high titer virus. The ones that were vaccinated with XON, uh, the, uh, the MAXON1 mutation were, uh, had no detectable virus, below the level detection. Um, and then importantly, they do some serology, which the Barrick Lab, it's not a forte, but we, they did it and we, we used to do it anyway. Um, and uh, they show that you get really good, um, uh, by looking at serum, you get really good PRNT50 numbers for, um, to show protection, to protective antibody, or at least antibody uh, against SARS. So neutralizing uh, antibodies. Neutralizing right? antibody, right. Yeah. Um, so it's great. I mean, it works really well. Uh, and... I think it's, I mean, I think I'm, I think it's a, it was a lot of work to get this far, but I think it works really good. Yeah, it is a huge amount of work and, and, uh, it's just a cool result. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Um, I, do you think they're going to take this as far as they can and see, see if they can get into clinical trials eventually? I mean, do we need a SARS vaccine? That's the question, I guess. Um, well, one of the reasons that we're now select is because there's no SARS vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so we do. <laughs> it'd be nice. It'd be nice. Uh, I mean, SARS, for SARS' sake, is probably not there anymore. I mean, I think the place that, that SARS vaccines would be needed would be people who work on SARS. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of like Ebola. But um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's, there's a long-term range here that they probably are looking down the future. But um, Initially, there's a lot more biology to understand about this, how this works. Yeah. Well, they say in the discussion, we need to test prime, this vaccine in primates to make sure that an XON approach is uh, stable. Yeah. yeah. Primate. Yeah, I don't, know if you, I don't know if Ralph's put in a grant for that or not, but yeah, we've, they've talked about that. Um, and then again, I said, like, they, we have other ways of attenuating SARS that we've identified, for, which is taking out interferon antagonists uh, from the, the genome, which you can delete and the virus still grows fine. Um, you can take out the, the other things that Ralph has worked on in the past have been the way that SARS makes all of its um, proteins is that in front of every ORF, 
there's a little sequence that has to match the, the sequence at the front of the genome. And so you can switch all of them so they all match each other, but something that's not seen in the environment. Mm. So that, that blocks recombination with a, a wild-type SARS virus coming out. Yeah, that's cool. Um, mm. So it was actually really cool. Nice. And I think it was Nature Med paper also uh, yeah. a couple years ago. Yeah, that's, so that's neat. If you start layering yeah. these things together, you could get a really nice attenuated virus that acts as a good vaccine yeah. Yeah. In, in old people, which is good too. So one th- I wanted to just mention uh, one thing before we leave this. Often polio is used as an example why we need to make new vaccines that that don't revert, right? Mm-hmm. However, um, polio, polio vaccines, the saving vaccines, revert in every recipient. Right. And it's only in a, a rare few that the reversion causes polio. And we don't know why that is, but hmm. the suspicion is that it's a host issue. You know, that the individuals who get polio, one in one and a half million primary doses, they have some immunocompromised mutation of some sort. So the reverted virus is actually quite safe, and probably the reversion is part of what makes it immunogenic because it replicates better. We don't know that for sure, but that's a speculation. So using polio as an example is probably not good because it's it probably is not very um, – if you're immunized, or uh, it's probably not an issue – uh, to have polio reverting, huh? You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. It's it's a it's a special case, probably. Yeah. That the the revertants in that case are causing disease, but at a very low rate, and probably only because there's some issue in right. the host. Could be could be a, a gut microbe issue. Yeah, it could sure. be a yeah, yeah. any now, variety of things. Now, if you have now, the problem is that these vaccine derived polio viruses, these revertants establish themselves in the environment and if you don't get the vaccine then you can get polio caused by them yes so that's a problem but in an in an immunized world it's it's not an issue and certainly if we could start over again we'd like to avoid that but i just thought i'd bring that up all right one other thing before you move on um the uh hour with dr kiki was twib number 83 so if people want to go back to that previous eckerly at all paper you can Okay, let's do some emails, and uh, let's start with Alan. Sure. Uh, Mike in Florida writes, Hi, and many thanks for a fascinating podcast. I look forward to each one. While I'm 61 and haven't had a science course since the late 1960s, I find the questions the hosts put to guests and to each other excellent examples of scientific inquiry and curiosity. Apologies if this has been asked and answered. From the fact that a new flu vaccine is produced annually and no new flu vaccines are produced in the interim, less than annually, I infer that the flu viruses mutate on an annual basis into a strain from which humans need protection. Is that a valid inference, or does the annual basis result from something else? Please correct me if I'm wrong, but if the new strain develops annually, is there something about flu viruses which produces such regularity? I would have thought that mutation doesn't observe a calendar. (laughs) Do the investigators pick a strain around the same time each year? Is there some deadline imposed by agencies so that, say, in the spring, the virus strain is chosen and the vaccine is then produced to be available later in the year? I find it odd that a new strain arises every year and that the vaccine becomes available around the same time every year, hence my questions. Thank you again for your efforts. I won't call it your work, since it's obvious each and all of you truly enjoy the discussions and are comfortable enough to joke among yourselves. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, those are... That's Excellent great. questions. Uh, I think we've addressed most of these on various twivs, but I don't know if we've have, have we gone through the whole thing on a particular. Uh, well, episode? we can we can we can certainly run here. Through. I View mean, it, yeah. I mean, basically, the virus is continually mutating, but we are constrained uh, in, in how long it takes to make a vaccine, such that yeah, by f- January, February of every year, WHO has to make a decision on whether to make a new vaccine or not or not so that'll be ready in the northern hemisphere here here by um august and september when which is when you start immunizing people and in fact the each year's each year's um virus crop does follow a more or less annual uh calendar in in the northern hemisphere because of the um i think we talked about this i don't remember the episode number but the this sort of observed phenomenon that flu season always seems to happen in the fall to winter months. Yeah, in the northern hemisphere. And in the northern hemisphere. In the opposite time in the southern, yeah. So there is a seasonality, there's production issues. And uh, different flu strains will compete. 
yeah. um, it, in a sense, uh, so that what you get is a dominant flu strain, or sometimes, I guess, two dominant flu strains that'll that'll yeah. overtake the population, and that becomes the flu for that year. And by the way, Mike, it doesn't. We don't change the vaccine every year. It depends on whether the viruses that are going to be circulating, that are predicted to circulate in the flu season, have changed sufficiently. Right. Is that really true? Yeah, that is that really there's true. There's some years that's all three same strains from one year to the next. 2009 well, and 2010 um, so th- were the same vaccine composition. So, in fact, oh. the 20, 2009 H1N1 pandemic strain, that vaccine has not been changed yet. It's still the same one. So and that one is incorpororated in the right. So so O nine was weird because the That was the shift. Yeah, that was that was um two thousand nine H one N one, the swine flu, um came out and wasn't already in the vaccine, and so that was that was the shift to this new strain. Um and that's why uh the vaccine manufacturers had to come out with an additional vaccine. Because of the timing of that, it was actually not a big problem for the vaccine manufacturers to do that because they'd already cranked out hundreds of millions of doses of the wrong vaccine, um, and, they, and they have the production capacity to do that on an annual schedule. So they, they turned to this equipment that they had just you know, finished using, and they fired it up again and ran out the new vaccine. And that so, strain so, has but, not changed since then. And, and so, that strain... It was in the 2010 uh, and... But that, 20- but that would make the 2010 seasonal vaccine, the, the three strains in it, were different from the 2009 seasonal vaccine. But the 20, I'm sorry, the 2010 and 2011, I believe, were the same. So in, okay, 20, so in, the 2000, seasonal three, okay. in 2009, there were two separate vaccines, right? right. There was the trivalent, that, which contained an H, a seasonal H1N1, HVN2, and the B strain. The two, then when the swine origin H1N1 came, came around, they made a new vaccine, as Alan said, and they gave it separately because they didn't know if combining it would work. Right. The following season, they made a decision to replace the seasonal H1 with the, the pandemic H1N1. So now we have a trivalent with uh, HVN2, pan, swine origin H1N1 and B. And the swine origin H1N1 has been the same strain since the original formulation in 2009 has not changed sufficiently to warrant making a new uh, right. vaccine strain. And in fact, the 2010, the three strains of the 2010 formulation were the same three strains that were in the 2011 formulation. So that H1N1 oh, yeah. became part of the seasonal vaccine. Then looking at 2011, um, the the WHO team that investigates this and, and comes up with what are the best strains to pick, picked the same strains. Okay, so the and H3N2 and the B strain didn't change from change year to year either. From those two years. Now, 2012, it changed. I see. Okay. Right. So there's a new, uh, the, the H1N1 is still in there, but then another one yeah. got swapped in. And so they come up with a, most years it ends up changing, some years it doesn't. The reason this is not widely promoted is because this is a vaccine that ideally people will get every year. And technically, if you got the 2010, you didn't need, probably maybe didn't need the 2011. Unless you're older. Unless you're older and your immunity waned yeah. or um, unless yeah. the immunity uh, stimulated by that particular vaccine, maybe in the general population, it didn't last long enough. we it's so well, hard. You don't have take for some reason in some people, so yeah. getting an extra boost would be better. Yeah. yeah, because because the formulation changes a little bit every year, a little bit every year. Um, it's very very hard to measure things like um, you know to know in the elderly population how's the antigenic response to all three strains in this year's vaccine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, we won't know that until at the earliest next year, at which point we'll have a different vaccine. Yeah. So, so everybody gets it every year. Basically. Right. So the idea is, yeah, and, and even knowing this, I've been covering the the uh, flu summit for the CDC and AMA for the past few years, and even knowing that it was the same vaccine, I went and got it again. Oh, it's a boost. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's not going to hurt you, honestly. <laughs> and everybody in my family got it again. So yeah. And now there's a quadrivalent vaccine, too. Yes, all of the manufacturers are now planning to roll out within 
I think all of them within the next two years will probably have quadrivalent vaccine. Yeah. So two A's and two B's. Right. What, what is interesting is that this season so far in the Northern Hemisphere, most of the flu A is H3N2, not swine origin H1N1. Hmm. Just that may not prevail, but H3N2. Uh, we did it. I, I did an interview with Derek Smith, who is um, involved in selection of flu strains every year. That's TWIV 99. 15 minutes. He explains it really well how uh, WHO gets the data that it uses for, for making this decision every year. So check huh. that out, Mike. And also, all of the flu vaccine manufacturers are very actively working on universal vaccines. Yep. Right. It's just, it, it's been a very hard problem, but everybody is interested in developing yeah. that. Then you could just get one. Yep. But his basic question is, does the flu change in, on a cycle? And it's just what we've been talking about where there's lower, fi- there's reduced fidelity or normal fidelity of, of flu, it, re- change, it mutates every round of replicates. So right. Um, right. based on immune pressures and based on just replication fitness, um, you do get changes. And when it changes a little bit, it's called antigenic shift or antigenic drift. When, it go f- when, you, when you have a big shift from an H1N1 to an H3N2, then that's called drift um, or sorry, shift. And, uh, and that's why we really need the vaccine. So go get vaccinated. Um, Alan, you should take the next one because it has to do with you. Same's at me. Okay, so Anthony writes, hi, Vincent et al. Why don't you simply have Alan call in and keep him on speakerphone? Have him keep his side on mute till he drops his internet connection. <laughs> that has to do with a long time ago you were having, you had a modem problem, remember? Yeah, uh, yeah I kept having my connection drop and then finally uh, Comcast replaced it, or replaced Fine. my modem, problem persisted and then they replaced it again and the problem was solved, so... Uh, anyway, he continues, I'm an IT person, network engineer at uh, University of Buffalo. Hi there, Rich, and molecular biologist aficionado. Thanks for all the tremendous educational work TWIV offers the novice, especially the H5N1 discussions. All right. Now it's somebody else's turn. Uh, Kathy. Okay, Josh writes, Dear TWIV doctors, thank you so much for reading my letter on TWIV 199 about the, re-emergence, or about the emergence of influenza in harbor seals covered on TWIV 198, and to Simon Anthony for his gracious reply, and congratulations on TWIV 200. However, the conclusions of this paper on harbor seals seem hard to wrap my head around. Maybe I'm getting cynical after 200 TWIVs, but there seem to be problems with the conclusion. A. Five seals. Isn't sample size key here? I mean, if someone's paper said, I sampled the tissues of five humans and... We would stop reading their paper. TWIF has taught me a very healthy distrust of small sample sizes. B. Doesn't adenovirus cause respiratory infection in humans? Wikipedia says AD14 does, including pneumonia. Well, and I'll just interject that a lot more than AD14 cause respiratory infection. Although not all seals tested positive for adenovirus, we don't actually know the ratio. It could be four out of five. Seals aren't humans, as you pointed out, but they are thinking H3N8 because of its effects on other species, including humans, aren't they? C. Should, shouldn't we test a bunch of healthy seals and see what we find in them? I mean, if we test five healthy seals and they all have H3N8 as well, then maybe seals are carriers of H3N8. Either way, it's not great for humans. D. I know you said you can't keep harbor seals in the lab, but the New England Aquarium has harbor seals, and they must have marine vets. University of Florida Gainesville has an aquatic animal vet program headed by Dr. Ruth Francis Floyd. Here's a link. Maybe they could be assessed after passing from other causes. So in other words, if you you could get harbor seals that died from other causes and then assay them for these um, various viruses. E. Lipkin and Anthony et al. are probably right. Probably. Pfeiffer's bacillus was also probably the cause of Spanish flu, right up until it wasn't. (laughs) Thanks, Josh. (laughs) So this is somebody who's thinking a lot about this paper, and um, he's right. They had a pretty small sample size with the five seals, and um, I didn't go back today and and look at that paper again, but I remember that, um, yeah, they, they had fairly small sample size, but they had to do with what they could, I think was was right. Um, and then, yes, adenovirus does cause respiratory infection in humans. Um, and um, I don't, 
I don't think they were necessarily just causing H3N8 because of its infects on other species. I, you know, I think they considered the other viruses as well. Um, again, I'd have to go back and look. Um, the idea of testing some healthy seals uh, to find out what the baseline is uh, might be useful, but you'd probably want to get healthy seals from the same general area um, potentially as where they had the H3N8. So that right. could have been the problem. So, I, and then, I, go ahead. They're all good points. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He's really thinking hard about this paper, and being skeptical is a good thing. But I, I wouldn't go so far as to say we would stop reading the paper if it only involved five patients. Right, right. I right. mean, we, we reported on a, a possible tick-borne virus that involved two patients. Yeah. Right. right. It's it's the interest of the virology, and it is it is very important to ask these sorts of questions and to say, can we conclude that this virus causes this illness? And in a case like this, well, no. But you can you can get together a lot of evidence and say, can we conclude that we ought to be looking for more of this virus? And the answer is, yeah, probably. So, and then his last comment about Pfeiffer's bacillus. Um, was something I'd never heard of. So, of course, I had to look up Pfeiffer's bacillus. And it was first named Bacillus influenzae, and it's now what's known as Haemophilus influenzae. Mm -hmm. So it was a bacteria that was thought to perhaps be causing flu, maybe at the time of Spanish flu. And as he says, it was probably the cause right up until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So, right. yeah. Now, I think that uh, if Josh is saying we shouldn't have published the paper, then that's not right, because they published the evidence they had, and that allows others, perhaps, to go out and, and do more experiments if they're interested in doing that, and that's how science works, right? Yeah. So I don't. I think the authors would were pretty circumspect about the conclusions. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they said, I just look back at the paper. They, I mean, they really couched everything knowing yeah. that what they had. But they did, I mean, it, the paper was actually really nice, nicely done. It is, yeah. Yeah. And it's Ian Lipkin. He'll sequence anything, so we're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and they did. They did an enormous amount of analysis, and they came up with um, with a pretty pretty plausible theory and an interesting um, yeah. thing to pursue. And yeah, these are this idea of testing um, testing healthy seals um, is a great idea. I think now mm -hmm. that we've got the idea that they can carry this sort of thing, um, why not go and see if they do? Right, Matt. You want to take the next one? Alexander. Sure. Uh, Alexander writes, hi, hi, love TWIV, and the weather's great here in Seattle, but won't be for much longer. Fall's coming. Uh, I had a question about a failed HIV experiment, experimental treatment from years ago in the mid-1990s. Genentech had a project to engineer CD4 receptors onto erythrocytes, red blood cells, based on the idea that HIV would enter the cell, but with no working nucleus in a red blood cell, the virus would be unable to replicate. There was some demonstration of this experimentally in papers like uh, he said it's a paper from Blood in 96 called, uh, titled Human Erythro Erythrocytes Bearing Electroinserted CD4 Neutralized Infection in Vitro by primary, primary Isolates of HIV Type 1. But if memory serves, uh, larger clinical trials failed for the then unknown reason that additional receptors, for example, CD24, are required to induce HIV infection. Has anyone considered going back and engineering erythrocytes with the full complement of cell service proteins and receptors required to induce infection. The basic approach seemed promising and elegant and applicable to viruses generally. Was it abandoned because the erythrocyte dead end idea is fundamentally unworkable or just because a particular implementation failed? Kind regards, Alexander from Seattle, Washington. So I think it's an interesting idea, um, but I think there's a lot that goes into HIV infection and uh, the, all the other receptors and dealing with different blood groups and combinations between people is that you know going to be going to complicate things along the way. And, and also, the whole idea of mopping up excess virus from the bloodstream is problematic when you're dealing with something like HIV that can persistently infect cells. Make huge right. amounts of virus. So, particles. so it only needs to get to a good target cell once, and it can maintain an infection indefinitely. Yeah. Right. And, and, the drug and a billion good. other vi a billion other particles could encounter um, whatever you've decoyed them to, and it wouldn't matter. Right, right. And and I had looked into this a little bit when we first this first came up in the queue. Uh, there was a PLOS One paper in uh, 2009 that looked at uh, 
this question in a little different way, and the title is Human Erythrocytes Selectively Bind and Enrich Infectious HIV-1 Virions. And the final sentence of the abstract is that um, uh, by analogy with HIV-1 bound to DC sign on dendritic cells, erythrocyte-bound HIV-1 might comprise an important surface reservoir for trans-infection of permissive cells. So it might be a bad thing to yeah. have erythrocytes sopping up HIV. Hmm. And if in your worst case scenario is you get an immune response to these um, red blood cells if you put them into someone, and which was shown in all the the, ad, the adenovirus-based HIV vaccine trials in Africa where they failed, was that you actually got a really good immune response to those that adenovirus strain, which then basically brought in all of the uh, exactly the cells that the HIV wants it to be close to. So hmm. any type of clustering, I think, of HIV is probably not a good idea. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, move on to some picks of the week. Um, let's start with you, Matt. Sure. So I found this. I don't remember where. I found it this week somewhere. So there's something that's called viral virus-associated pyramids, or VAPs. So this was from, I saw the initial picture in this um, cell uh, kind of microscopy page called Cell Picture Show. So there's no way to get to the exact thing by a link, but in picture 11 on there is this picture of something that does not look <laughs> anything like a virus to me, <laughs> terribly produced. But it, you, have to, you have to click, everyone should click on the link to look at it. It looks what? like a little pyramid of triangles on the surface of a cell. Mm -hmm. And I looked it up, and this is caused by um, a virus called um, SIRV2, uh, which is, stands for Sophobulus rod-shaped virus 2. Um, it infects archaea. And the virus actually expresses a protein uh, that makes these structures on the surface of archaea to basically make a big hole <laughs> and lysis the cell so the virus can get out. And I can't believe that a virus does this. It's amazing. The <laughs> yeah, pictures cool. are yeah. so cool. And then so and I think also a paper where they initially did this, um, and the guys who did this were um, uh, David, uh, I don't know how you pronounce his last name, uh, Pragnishvili. Can we go there? Mm -hmm. um, and he's worked on a lot of these different uh, archaea viruses. And so in this paper, they basically show that they can um, purify these particles out, and you and you can look at them by EM, and and they make little little pyramids and punctures outside of the cell. And then this e, this EM picture, I thought was just beautiful. Yeah, that's really that is gorgeous. And even the other eleven pictures in this little yeah, slideshow nice. are worth looking at. They're yes. they're really gorgeous. Yeah. I don't know. I keep liking archaea and archaea viruses more and more. It's really well, you should work on them. You could put uh, ethylene glycol in your incubators to get eighty degrees centigrade. You know, right? <laughs> oh, it's something I really want to do. Yeah, I noticed the first comment here is by Michelle Osborne, mm -hmm. who was on Twiv a while ago. Oh, good. Thank you, Matt. Sure. Alan, what do you have? Uh, I have. A, um, a video, this is a YouTube video, so if you click it, it'll autoplay. I wish they would do away with that. But um, it's a fun archival video from AT&T. AT&T did these, um, uh, these science educational videos uh, back in the, I think, 1950s. And this one features one of the coolest physics teaching tools I've ever seen. Uh, so the video is called Similarities of Wave Behavior. And it's this fellow using this uh, this wave demonstration device that um, you have to see to to see what it does. <laughs> but it's a um, it it allows you to visualize waves moving through it, and he configures it in different ways to show uh, what happens when any kind of wave moves from one medium to another, uh, or you try to change the wavelength, or you you adjust the frequency, and he, he demonstrates a whole bunch of concepts, and of course, all of this applies to sound waves and light waves and radio waves and any other kind of waves you'd like to think of. Um, so it's it's incredibly broadly ap applicable, and he, he touches on everything from the structure of the inner ear to um, uh, to how to how a lens works um, in, in the course of discussing these waves and using this really, really neat demonstration tool. Mm. Yeah, it's very cool. I like it. 
Thank you for that. And I want one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Go it for spent it. hours to. They're hundreds of dollars. But. Oh. <laughs> Kathy, what do you have? Well, when we were doing this silk stabilization uh, paper, they mentioned the glass transition temperature. So I thought I better check that out. And in doing that, I ended up on this page that's uh, all about crystals and things. And uh, <laughs> they describe the glass transition uh, with a really cool analogy to snakes in a snake pit. And then if you click on – a couple of the links um, were broken, but if you click on another one, they talk about how uh, crystal arrangements can be uh, similar to sock drawers, and some people have them all folded up neatly, and they have a picture of that kind of sock drawer and then the ones where they're all jumbled together. But um, it did a nice job of explaining for me what the uh, glass transition temperature is and then – uh, there was a link to another page about the differential scanning calorimetry, which is another um, approach used in that silk uh, paper. So uh, it just kind of took me off on a tangent of learning about a little more of this physical biochemistry stuff. The main site is pretty cool, actually. Yeah. The whole yeah. Macro, what is it? Macro Galleria. Neat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are your uh, socks neatly organized there, Kathy? No, but I have an entire dresser that's just socks. Really? <laughs> multiple, multiple drawers, yeah? Multiple drawers. Yeah, my socks. They're all, they're all a mess. My socks are, are all neat. I'll bet Alan's are all neat. Yes. And I have no idea about Matt. And what do you think? I would say yours are a mess. They are. But I have, I have a dozen <laughs> pairs of the exact same sock, so I just click for two socks and I'm good to go. What do you think? You're Steve Jobs? It's easy. <laughs> I, when you have a three-and-a-half-year-old and a, a six-month-old in the morning, finding socks is not something you want to spend time on. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my pick today is a video from the BBC. It's called U.S. Cattle Country in Uproar at Virus Lab Plan. This is actually I found on Twitter from uh, Connor Bamford. So I stole it from, from you, Connor. Thank you. Uh, it's a short interview with a number of people at the Manhattan, Kansas uh, site where they would like to build a BSL-4 to study uh, animal viruses, and they're having some trouble there, and um, the local cattle people don't like the idea. And uh, it, there's not a lot of scientific content, but uh, it is an interesting segue, I guess, to TWIV 200 where we talked about the problems with the Boston BSL-4 right. uh, facility. Yeah. Yeah, and the question that immediately arises when you see this sort of local local resistance to a facility like this is, well, where should it be? Yeah, and it's not an easy question to answer. I mean, from our visit to the boss to the needle, we were impressed at how secure and safe the procedures are. Right, but of course, when you add very large animals to the equation, it gets more complicated. I, I imagine. Yeah, and also. You know, the, the procedures there are very safe and secure currently. Um, as these facilities age and people get accustomed to things, you know, you hope that all of that will will stay up to pace. Yeah. Um, but you can never completely eliminate risk. And yeah. so there will always be concerns about this sort of thing. Do you know what the reason? So this, this new virus, the new uh, lab is basically replacing Plum Island, That's right? That's my yes. understanding, yeah. So... Um, why not renovate? It seems like Plum Island is a better place for this type of thing. Well, if you initially it seems that way because it's an island, but right. it being an island, apparently the current facility is in such bad shape and so far below code that it would be a teardown. So you're talking about building an entirely new facility on an island, um, which, by the way, was just hit by a major storm that flooded yeah. and destroyed infrastructure across an entire region. Right. Um, so, <laughs> so at least one risk has been very clearly illustrated. Um, there's okay. no, there's Kansas, no tornadoes there's, in the middle of this place either. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, but you, can build, you can build with tornadoes in mind. Um, there are lots of structures that are, that are in the Midwest that, uh, that have been built to survive 200 mile an hour winds and, and you know, having a telephone pole thrown into them at the speed of a freight train. Um, 
So you can build for those sorts of things. You could probably build on an island and build it to survive a hurricane. But as soon as you start doing things off on an island, everything's got to be transported in by boat. And you add the expense of transporting all your personnel back and forth every day. And, um, and, and it starts to become a huge production. And, of course, you can only expand to the boundaries of the island. Sure. So there, I, I think there are probably some pretty compelling reasons for not keeping it on Plum Island. Um, but then where do you put it? Do you put it in Kansas? They don't want it there. It's not going to be any better in Texas. It's uh, any place rural is going to have cattle around. So, and then you try and put it in a city uh, and they don't want it in the city either. Well, and if you, yeah. And the other thing is if you do put it in a city, I kind of jokingly suggested on, on, in response to this discussion on Twitter, I said, well, you know, maybe we ought to put the animal facilities in the cities and the human pathogen facilities out in the middle of nowhere. Um, (laughs) But if you if you imagine the scope of a facility that's going to work on cattle and pigs and sheep, it's a lot of acreage. Right. So now instead of the, they're talking about a billion dollar facility here already, and that's building it in Manhattan, Kansas. Um, I can't even imagine what the cost would be if you built it in Manhattan, New York. Right. I mean, you have room. That's well, the good part. You're not. Yeah. You're not allowed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, they have a BL four in Galveston, right? So it's the sure. same idea. But that's yeah. that's again that's human pathogens. Well, the the, uh, the New York City code prevents a BSL four from being built right. here. Really? Yeah. Huh. Um, so when our movie comes out, check it out, and you can see this uh, the security of the needle. Yeah. And if you're wondering where that is, it's my fault. I've, I we have to edit it down. Right now, it's about two hours, and we want to bring it down to a little bit less. And uh, I was going to edit it, but then Sandy came along, and ah, but I'm getting back to it. Before the end of the year, it should come out. I've seen a preview. It's really, it's really a lot of fun. It's really I think good. you have to have it released before the end of the year to be uh, considered for an Oscar. So you know. <laughs> ah, yes, we better do that. <laughs> right. Uh, we have two listener picks of the week. One is from Ricardo, our friend in Portugal. Hello, TWIV members. I'm sending a listener pick of the week. It's a scientific article with 29 authors in which 26 are between 8 and 10 years old. It was published in Biology Letters, and its title is Black Autumn Bees. has a little movie on the journal page, but it was also featured on a TED episode. And he gives us the link to that. Very good. Sci- for scientists and teachers, best regards to all of you. And the TED movie is it was new to me, and it's really cool because partway through, there's a live frog playing a game on an iPhone <laughs> that's <laughs> worth seeing. So check it out. And you had mentioned that Rich had picked this. And this that's has some of the coolest right? tables and figures I've ever seen. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. Do, I want to make, I want to let my, uh, my daughter's daycare class make my figures next time. It's a good idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. And we also have a pick from Tony. Hi there, Virolators. I discovered your podcast because I follow Abby Smith's ERV blog. I'm a recreational creationist baiter. Uh, (laughs) And just love the plain language yet in-depth treatments of real science unmediated by some of the more annoying elements of journalism. This is really the way I like that. No offense taken. (laughs) (laughs) This is really the way I like to have science communicated, and I have to congratulate you all and your team of helpers in MicroWorld, etc., for this wonderful product. I love living in the future. To my pick, the weird and arty pop singer, songwriter, and artist Bjork released an album that is integrated into a beautiful app with wonderful games and music sequencers and artwork called Biophilia. It's a truly extraordinary concept album slash piece of interactive art for the 21st century. Anyway, there are two tracks, apps in particular, that I thought would be of interest to you guys. One is called Virus. The film clip that comes with it has a CGI animation of cells being invaded and taken over by viruses. The sequencer that comes with the track is great fun to play with and make your own music. The second one is called Hollow, and the film clip is directed by biomedical animator Drew Berry, who some may know from his award-winning computer animations of biomolecules inside cells. Anyway, just had to share. Keep up the good work, and thanks. Cool. Yeah, those are cool. Mm. They're really neat. So thanks for pointing those out. I didn't know that Bjork had made a virus song. It's pretty cool. 
And that will do it for TWIV 207, which will be found at iTunes, the Zune Marketplace, twiv.tv, and microbeworld.org slash twiv. As usual, we love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Matt Freeman is at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Thanks for joining us today, Matt. It was very uh, much fun as always. Thank you very much for having me. We're on a coronavirus roll here, aren't we? This is a Barrick Lab roll. It's good. Yeah, Barrick. Cool. We got to get on a Freeman Lab roll, right? Yeah, we're getting there. All right. Hey, we have, yes, well, we're working on it. Papers are coming out. I'm sure you are. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And what I have to point out Kathy's yep. former grad student is in Ralph Barrick's lab as a postdoc, Lisa Gerlinski. Yep. Wow, yep. cool. It's a very small world. It is. Science is a small world. Alan Dove can be found at alandove.com and on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me underneath the house pulling out. No, no. <laughs> no, no. We finished that. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>